Well, welcome again to Sacred City Church. My name is Justin. I'm one of the pastors here. And we have been working verse by verse through the book of Exodus. Uh, we are 13 chapters deep into the book of Exodus. And you can see we are not in Exodus today. Um, we are taking a one-week break from our Exodus series. We'll be back in it next week because we've got a very special guest with us today. Um, if you don't know, we're a part of a larger network of churches. It's called Acts 29 Network. We are a global network, really a global family of diverse churches all around the world. And um, it's and it's funny because we've got, I think, I can't remember now, six, six 700 churches all, all the way around the world, and yet we're the only Acts 29 church in Iowa. So it feels kind of like we're out here on an island in the middle of the Midwest, but we do have um, several Acts 29 uh, churches up in the Chicago area, and it's our joy today to invite Derek Puckett to come and preach the gospel for us. He's coming from Renewal Chicago Church in um, in Chicago, they are preaching the same gospel up there, and God is doing a great work up in Chicago. And I'm excited to come and have our brother bring us the word this morning. Um, I got to hang out with him and his daughter. Uh, you know he's a cool guy when he brings his daughter. I was like, you know, it's like he's, he's like, I brought my daughter. I'm like, how old? Seven. I'm like, I got a six-year-old. Let's do this. So we brought our girls out last night to the, to the East Village, and they got to see Santa and pet, pet some animals, and then we got to eat some food, and it's good. So I am excited. Now listen. All right? We preach the same gospel, right? The same gospel that produces fruit here produces fruit in Chicago. But he's in a different context up there. You guys know he's in a different context up in Chicago. And so we talked a little bit last night. He's used to having some feedback. All right. Okay. Okay. All right, so we're going to have to warm it up. It's going to take some engagement. He might, have, he might call you out a little bit, but he's used to some. I said, hey, they don't say nothing to me, so... I'll be jealous. I'll be jealous if they do. So, all right, well, let's, I'm going to pray. I'm going to invite Derek up, and he's going to bring the word uh, of God to us this morning. Father, we, I thank you so much for my brother. I thank you for the gift uh, to our network that he is, our gift to our Midwest region that he is, a gift that he is going to be to us now, even as he preaches, and as next week he, he speaks to those that are in Porterbrook. I thank you for this gift, and I pray that you would anoint him now, that you would use his words, that it would be all of you and none of him. Think through his mind, speak through his vocal cords, Father, uh, and to you be the glory this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, brother. Welcome. Welcome him. Well, good morning, Sacred City. There you go. There we go. Come on now. Let's, let's, let's try it again. Good morning, Sacred City. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is good to be here. I'm thankful to Jesus, who's the Lord and Savior of my life and the, the head of this house and all the houses that claim him as Lord around the nation, including Renewal. I'm coming from Renewal, Chicago. We're a multi-ethnic church in Chicago, Illinois, right outside the West Loop. So we're right around the United Center area, if you're familiar with Chicago. And as Justin said, it's, it, he's the only Acts 29 church here in this area of Iowa, but I'm the only black guy in the whole region, so, <laughs> so you know, <laughs> we got to hold it down, but we're going we're gonna to bring some more into our network. But I'm thankful for him. I'm thankful for your leader and pastor here uh, and him just sharing the story. You guys going from singing in the pub over in East Village to now seeing well over 200 people and planting another church in Moline. God's doing some great things here through Sacred City, and I'm thankful for all he doing here, but I'm thankful for your leader, my friend, too. And if you're thankful for your leader and your pastor here, Justin, here at the church, would you put your hands together for him? <laughs> Y'all could do better than that. This brother's leading. He didn't know I was going to do that, but I can't. It's not like me to go someplace else else and not say thank you to the pastor. So I'm thankful for God and all he's doing here and his faithfulness here at this church. And, and I want to say thank you to you also. Um, I'm a fellow church planner, and I know what it's like to plant a church and Show up the first Sunday, and you're kind of like, well, who's going to show up? I don't know. Uh, what's going to happen? First snow, like today, what's going to happen? We don't know what's going to happen, but I'm thankful for you guys and putting your hands to the plow here and being faithful in this city and in this context and seeing the glory of Jesus here uh, come to fruition. So thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you guys. Today we're going to be in John chapter 4, as we just read, uh, but specifically we're going to be talking about hidden idols. Hidden idols. And before we get into that, I, I want to talk specifically about what an idol is. I want you to say this with me, so we're going to practice, all right? An idol can be anything. An idol can be anything. 
An idol can be in it, anything. Idolatry is when we take the good things of God, the good things that God gives us, and we make those things the ultimate things in our lives. It's when we start to worship the creature or the created thing versus the creator, God himself. That's idolatry, and an idol can be anything. An idol can be anything, simply anything. So today, again, I want to talk about hidden idols. And these are the idols in our lives that are somewhat hidden because we're immersed in them on a daily basis. These are the idols of society, idols of culture, race, religion, politics. See, they're hidden because we don't naturally think of those as idols. Those are not the things that we see. Those are not the things that we can hold in our hands. Those are not the things that we, we point out are our shortcomings in our lives. But these are the things that we're immersed in on a day-to-day -day basis, and we don't think about them as idols. But in a day like today where young black men are getting killed or police officers are getting shot and, and we hear about politics on the, on the news every day, what happens is these cultural and these racial idols, these societal idols, they start to rise up within us and we start to react in ways that we didn't know we could. These hidden idols start to come out. So this is where I want to spend our time today. Now, we won't necessarily be able to touch on every idol that's hidden in our lives, but the hope is that it, it will help you get under the covers in your heart and, and, and dive deeper into in your heart and what Jesus is doing there so he can unveil and reveal these hidden idols in your life, and you, and you know what to do with those as they come up. So again, we're going to be in John chapter 4. I'm not going to read off 42 verses again, but uh, we're going to be there, and I'm sorry, my man, you had to read all of that, but... And we're, going to, we're going to talk about the whole thing today, John chapter 4. But before we go any further, again, I want to talk about hidden idols. I want to pray. Would you pray with me? And Father God, thank you so much for this morning. And God, I just pray simply one thing is that you would hide me behind the cross and that you would increase in this place. Let me decrease so that you have your way. Lord, I pray that your people would hear a word from you. And we pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And we all said together. Amen and amen. Well, just the other day, my wife, and she went to visit her aunt. She went to visit her aunt and my daughters for the first time. They got to visit their second cousins. They got to visit their second cousins. I have four daughters. Y'all need to pray for me anytime y'all get. I'm a, I'm a man, but I'm, I, it's five of them in the house, including my wife now. So y'all need to pray for me. I, if, you, if you're ever in the city of Chicago and you want to go golf in it, well, when we can golf, or you want to go out to tea or something, y'all, I'm always available, I promise. <laughs> but, but they were visiting their second cousins, and they got to playing they started baking cookies. They started making brownies. And the bad thing about having women in the house is they bring all these goodies home. So I'm trying to be good, but they keep tempting me. So they're having a ball, and, and it gets to the place where my wife is like, it's time to go home. And she tells Ramaya, my daughter who I brought with me today, she says, it's time to go, Maya. And you know how kids get when they're having a good time. They start crying, and they don't want to leave. And, and, and mom's like, it's time to go. Maya's starting to cry. And get this, the older cousin that she just met tells her, she says, look, Maya, why don't you go hide over there? If you go hide, your mom will forget that she told you it's time to go. <laughs> no, we don't do that. But she goes to hide, and, and, and my wife is trying to be cordial, keeping the conversation going. So she's continually talking, and, and, and all the while, see, the thing, the thing about this, if you have kids, you know, and you've probably been there one time before. The thing about it is that as a parent, you don't forget that you told your child to go get their stuff. It's time to go. But you're trying not to be rude and say, go get your stuff. I told you to get your stuff. And you're just talking. And, and they, but the, the other side is the, the kid thinks that you're, you actually forgot. So they go hide or they keep playing, and all the while, as a parent, you're getting more and more furious by the second. You're upset. And see, when you walk out the door, this is what happened. Mama wasn't happy no more, y'all. <laughs> she started turning green like the Incredible Hawk and, and just snapped on Maya. And, and Maya's just crying like, what did I do? And see, here's the point. Hiding is never good. It's the same thing with hidden idols in our lives. When they start to reveal themselves in our lives, it's never a good thing. 
It's never a good thing. See, these are the idols that are not easily noticed. They may not be the deep heart idols or the idols that drive you like power, money, love, or success. But these are the ones that because of your culture, because of the color of your skin, you don't tend to notice. For example, our culture. We live in this culture of me, right? Everything revolves around me. We, we don't like to recognize it, but we simply won't do anything or want to get involved with anything if it doesn't benefit us. We, we don't want to do anything that will stretch us. We want everything to be com- convenient. We won't commit to things. We want it our way like Burger King. We, we won't date, date unless that person has everything we want. See, I love counseling young guys, but one of the things that frustrates me, and I was there at one point, is that every guy comes to me and they say, I mean, I want a girl that's five, five, thick thighs, pretty skinny, spinny waist, all that, and a bag of chips. I want all of that. And I'm like, bruh, have you looked in the mirror? <laughs> about 70 pounds overweight talking about you on a track body. I'm like, come on, man. And the thing about it is that the relationship's not even about us. It's about serving the other person. See, that's this me idol that's driving him. It's the me idol. Things have to be quick like a microwave. Because everything we do revolves around me and what's in it for me. And don't hear me saying, don't do things for you. But see, what's happened is that society or this cultural idol of me is starting to drive you. And if you raise like me, my mama always told me to run. The world don't revolve around you, boy. But, but see, what's happening is this me idol's driving you. And then sadly what happens is that when things don't go your way, your world is ruined. Or that girl or that boy doesn't like you because you're, 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 you're too self-absorbed. Or you, you just can't keep a good job. Because when it gets hard, you want to quit. Or things don't go your way, you want to leave. You see, what's happening is that this me idol is driving everything. This cultural me idol is driving everything. You see where I'm going with this? You see, things can easily be hidden in society. And what tends to happen is that it drives a certain narrative in our lives. And that's what happens. It's these hidden idols that they start to drive everything that goes on in our life. And see, in our passage today, in John chapter 4, we're specifically going to look at this cultural and this racial hate between the Samaritans and the Jews that has existed for hundreds and hundreds of years. It, it, it's, it's, it's drove the way they interact, and I would simply call that a hidden idol. It's a hidden idol. So as we jump into this text here at the beginning, you see in, that Jesus has just left Judea. He's traveling to Galilee. We see this in verse 3. Now, the interesting thing about this is that in verse 4, the text says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Remember that. He had to go through Samaria. That word had. See, the truth is, yes, to get to Galilee, it was the shortest distance. It took about four hours or so to get through, uh, go through Samaria to get through Galilee. But he didn't have to go through Samaria. See, the Jews, they avoided Samaria at all costs. They, they hated the Samaritans. There was this deep hostility, this long history that existed between the Samaritans and the Jews. They did not like each other. It dates all the way back to 722 B.C., 700 years and counting right now. And it still exists today. It began when the Assyrians, they took over the, over Israel, they intermarried with the Israelites and they procreated. And this is where you get these people called the Samaritans. Jews to this day still call them half-breeds. Half-breeds. They do not like them. They, they're, they're half-breeds or they're dogs. See, and then some, some years later, during the Persian period, the Jews were allowed back in to rebuild the temple. The Samaritans tried to resist them from coming back in. They didn't want them to come back in and rebuild the temple because they hated them. But then on the other side, the Jews didn't want the, the Samaritans to get involved with the rebuilding of the temple because they wanted to keep the purity of their race. They hated them. You see, with this bit of information, you see that there's this deep amount of hostility that's between them, and it's driving how they interact. It was a racial, a, a cultural hate that had been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. And here's the point. Friends, I want you to remember this. With any amount of hostility, with any amount of, of hate, a racial, cultural hate that has existed between different cultures, different races, friends, there's always a history. There's always a history. 
Now, now, we can try to neglect it, but we really can't neglect it. We can try to change it. We can't change it. History is what it is, but we have to recognize history in order to move forward. We have to acknowledge it. But see, most of the problem here in, in America is that when it comes to race, when it comes to problems that, that keep us separate, is that we don't know the history of racial problems in America. Or we don't like to acknowledge it. We don't like to, we neglect it. We just try to keep moving. And we, don't, we don't realize or acknowledge where we come from. You see, we have to acknowledge it in order to move forward, but we don't know a lot about it. See, see we never heard about scientific racism. That says that black people, because of their big noses and their bigger lips, they derive from a people with leprosy. And because of that, it gave some supposedly scientific evidence that black people should be slaves. Or Jim Crow laws that existed all the way up through the 1960s that said if a black person that went to a bathroom that said white only or drank from a water fountain that said white only, they could legally be beat on the spot. That existed all the way up to the 1960s. We're talking about 60-something years ago. Oh, oh, we think about Chicago native Emmett Till. Emmett Till goes down to Mississippi to visit some relatives and and supposedly, as he's in the store, leaving the store, 14 years old or so, is, he whistles at a white woman. Supposedly whistles at her, and, and a few days later, he's dragged out of the house, has one eye gouge popped out of his head, gets shot in the head, and if that's not enough, they tie a barbed wire around his neck and a 70-pound cotton gin tied to that and throw him in the river. See, there's much more. But see, the point is, that many of us have, be, have this ignorant knowledge of history. And hear me, when I say ignorant, I do not mean stupid. The root word of ignorant is ignore. And we begin to ignore history. We begin to ignore the systems and the problems in place where we act nonchalant towards incidents in Ferguson, Missouri, or Eric Garner, or Tamir Rice, or Alton Sterling, or Philando Castile. And family, I'm not just talking about majority culture or white people at this time. I'm talking about minorities, too. We have an ignorant history of, of uh, we have an ignorant knowledge of our history. And see, little do we know that, that our history has kind of formed where we are today. It makes us who we actually are. It, it, it forms how we go about our daily lives. I mean, for years, what kept black people pushing through the civil rights movement, what kept us going through slavery, is the knowledge of what those that had gone through before us, what they had fought for, that's what kept us going. See, family, in order for us to recognize these hidden idols, these, these, these cultural, these racial societal idols that are deep within us, we have to have an adequate knowledge of history, of where we come from in order to move forward. We have to understand why we are the way we are. But see, here's the problem. Just like with the Israelites and the Samaritans in this text, there's a deep racial hate. There's a deep cultural hate that has existed in the U.S. that outweighs much more than anything we believe. We may not see it, but it's hidden beneath us. It, it, it outweighs even what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, that God has made all of us in his image not just black, not white, not Asian, not Hispanic, but all of us in his image. He's made each of us in his image. But what has happened, sadly, friends, is that there's long-standing hate between us. And, and, and now this racial pride starts to rear his ugly face in our lives. And, and, and cultural idolatry and, and idolatry of race, it, it starts to rear up. And these things start to form. And, and because of that, what happens is we begin to pigeonhole people. Oh, he's black, man. He must be a thug. Oh, he's white, man. He, he must have some money or he doesn't like black people. Oh, oh he's a police officer. He's gonna, he, does, he, he doesn't know what he's going to do. He's going to shoot another black kid. Oh, he's Hispanic. Oh, man, they're taking all our jobs. See, we start to pigeonhole people and not try to get to know that person. We don't dig under the covers and like, man, why am I actually reacting this way? Why do I actually believe that without actually knowing that person? See, hear me, friends. We rarely look at our culture. We rarely look at our race or societal views as an idol. But let another black man get killed. How are you going to react? Let another police officer 
get shot? How, how do you react? Ryan Lochte this summer with the U.S. Olympics, you guys remember, he got in trouble. But he's, he's just another child and he's having fun. How do you react to that? During this political race, yeah, we're going to take it there. How do you react to what Trump says or, or, or Hillary says that, that, that doesn't go with what you think is true? I'm not saying you shouldn't have a reaction. What I'm, I'm trying to get to is where is that reaction coming from? Where, where does that stem from? Is it because of your race? Is it because of your culture? Is it because of what you believe? Family, you see where I'm going with all of this? It's tough, but, but we have to be able to dig under the covers and see these hidden idols in our lives. You see how you can have hidden idols without even knowing it? These cultural and these societal idols, they're hidden. They're not e easily noticed because we're in, it's intertwined with our DNA. It, it, it's, we're immersed in them on a day-to-day -day basis. And you may say, well, man, God made me this way. This is, the way I, this is what I believe. This is the color of my skin. This is the way I... No, God made all of us in his image. But because of sin, because of society, because of the way you've been raised, friends, it, it's tainted the picture. It's tainted how God has made us. He made us good to be at peace with one another, be at peace with him. But because of sin, friends, what has happened that is sadly this cultural idol, this racial idol has trumped the gospel in your life. It has trumped what Jesus has actually deemed real and deemed right for us. The fact that he made all of us in his image. We have to be able to critically look at our culture, look at our race, see how it's driving us. I mean, you look at this text. All I've talked about already, and, and knowing that the Jews and the Samaritans, they, uh, these Jews would travel around Samaria. They did not want to go through that. They would, they would travel days out of the way. But here's the catch. This is a 700-year-old hatred. 700 years by the time Jesus gets to this place. So that means that these disciples don't even know the Samaritans at this time. They don't know them. They really don't have a problem with them, but because of the way they've been raised, because of their culture, they know, oh, no, Jesus, we don't go there. We don't like those people. This is what kept them divided. I mean, some of them can't even articulate the problem anymore. But they say, Jesus, because of our culture, they see where Jesus is going. They said, no, those are dogs, Jesus. They're half-breeds. We don't go there. We don't, we don't go south of locusts. We don't go there. No, no, Jesus, we don't do that. And see, Jesus knows all of this. Disciples come back in verse 27, and they marvel at this woman. Don't say a word. They marvel that Jesus is talking to them, talking to her. And, and, and Jesus knows that what the culture says, what, what the divide says. And he says, he, he, he tells them right now, he, he's, it, it goes back to verse 4. Remember I said that, that word had? Remember that ver word had? See, Jesus knows he shouldn't be there. He knows that the culture says don't come here. The, the racial idol keeps them divided. But Jesus, in verse 4, the text says he had to go through there. Now, this word in the Greek is pronounced day. It means simply that it was necessary. It was necessary. So this word is almost always used when God or Jesus do something by divine providence, which means that Jesus did this on purpose. Y'all. This means that he was intentional. It means that Jesus' mission was for all people. Black, white, Asian, we go all the way down the line. Jesus was for all people. He wasn't just sent for the Israelites at this time. He wasn't just sent for the Samaritans, but for all people. He had to go through there. Now, see, what I want you to notice here is the difference between Jesus and the disciples. It's a big difference here. Jesus is intentional, but, but the disciples see Jesus. They're like, no, we're not going to go through there. But Jesus doesn't stop because of somebody's status. Because of their race, their culture, their gender, et cetera. No, he, he sees that they're, they're hurting. Jesus doesn't back away. No, he steps into the problem with them. He steps in. But the disciples say, oh, no, no. They actually disappear. 
They go to the next town. They leave the whole picture. Leave Jesus alone. We don't want to have anything. They leave their Savior, their Lord with this woman. They, have no, they don't know who she is. They just leave. We don't, that's how deep it is. See, the problem is that may be some of us in here. I'm just in Davenport for a job. I like the Quad Cities. I, I love the attractions of all of this. I, I love my neighborhood. I, I, but, but the city in itself, I, I really don't want to dive in. People over there, people over there. Not, this is my little pocket. This is my circle. This is Sacred City. This is where I want to stay. But, but there's people outside hurting. There's people outside that need to know Jesus. And, but no, no. I'm just here for this reason. This is why. Disciples, they don't care that these people need a savior. They don't care that this woman is hurting. They don't care that she's in sin. They don't care that she's had five husbands and she's been ostracized from society. No, they don't care. Matter of fact, in the text, they never even acknowledge this woman. They don't say, how you doing? Hey, what's your name? Or anything. They come back and the first thing they say is in verse 31. They say, Rabbi, eat. 31 verses, and they, all they have to say is, Rabbi, eat. You know why? Because their culture trumps their love for God and his mission. It's a hidden idol. It's something that has become ultimate in their lives, and God has taken a back seat. I mean, it's like earlier this year. You all remember when Harambe the gorilla got shot? Man, there were more posts, more social media uproars about this gorilla getting shot. And I'm not for animal cruelty or anything, but the gorilla got shot, and, and we talked about that so much, more than the, the fact that young black boys and young black girls get shot and killed in Chicago every day. They get shot and killed here. But Harambe, the gorilla got shot. We had to shut down social media. See, I'm not for the cruelty of animals, but the thing is, friends, the reason that these can be so important, the thing that, that makes us react to this, is because of this cultural idol. And see, what's happening is that we view, okay, that's Harambe. I care about animals, but, you know, those black little boys getting killed, man, they're thugs. They deserve that. Oh, man, those dudes getting killed and shooting each other, they're crazy. They're gang members. We start to say things like that, and we start to believe things like that. Oh, it's outside of my little circle, so I don't, I don't really care about that. But, friends, when we think things like this, the understanding of what God says in Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27, making all of us in his image, not Harambe, Making all humans, humans in his image, that, that, that mission, that, that truth, it, it's, it's in the back seat now. It's taking a back seat to what we believe in our culture. It's taking a back seat to what we believe about our identity. And all of a sudden, what happens south of Locust, what happens in, in the other part of Quad Cities, what, what happens here, it does not really affect me. Or maybe it has nothing to do with my culture. I, I despise it. It's not in my little circle, so I don't want to have anything to do with it. But Jesus in this text, he does not back away from this woman. He doesn't. He, he goes to her. He steps into her mess. He, he engages her. But sadly, most of us, we tend to be like the disciples. We struggle with this. We don't pay attention. To, we don't like to care. Or, or they're, they're different than me. I don't even know how to approach that issue. I don't know what to do right here. I'm, I, Jesus just sat by a well. And talked to a woman. He didn't do anything specific. Just started talking to her and engaged her. It's as easy as that. See what happens if it doesn't affect my little circle or my culture. Then it doesn't matter. See we as Christians we begin to obey the culture more than what the word of God says. In Acts 1.8 where it says be my witnesses to the other ends of the world. See, the mission of God takes a back seat to our culture. And you look at this text. Like I said before, these disciples, they don't care about the Samaritans. They, they don't care that they're actually in Samaria. That's what trips me out. They're in Samaria. 
But they don't care about these Samaritans and, and, and G, that Jesus is talking to this woman. They keep trying to get him to eat for three different verses. They're talking about Jesus eating. And in verse 34, Jesus finally fed up with it. He says, look, 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 my food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are not yet four months, four months, then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Mm. See, here's the kicker. Jesus gives them an agricultural illustration, and they would understand this. He says, look, the will, I'm here, here to, I'm sent to do the will of the one who sent me. And do you not say, there's four months, then the harvest. He says, look up. The fields are ripe. Now, to understand what Jesus is saying, you have to re re remember where they are in the context that they are. Where are they right now? They're in Samaria. So when Jesus says the fields are ripe for harvest, who is he talking about? The Samaritans. But sadly, these disciples don't realize who Jesus is talking about, nor do they care because of their cultural and racial hate. This idol that's deep within them. See, I can picture, picture this with me. Jesus, probably in, in, a, in a more boisterous voice, like, do you not say? The, the, the fields are ripe for harvest right now. I can picture him saying this. And he says, look up. Lift up your eyes. And as soon as the disciples stop looking at him and they look up, all they see is droves of Samaritans coming to them. See, all these people coming to them. But they fail to realize it because of their hidden idol. Family, is that us this morning? Is there a cultural, a, a racial idol that's hidden deep within us, that's driving us? Well, we don't want to talk to people. We don't like to work with people. We don't want to eat with people that are different than us. Maybe not even different racially, maybe socioeconomically. And I, I don't want to deal with those people. They're different than me. Does your culture trump your belief of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Maybe you're saying, no, nah, that's not me. Okay, well, let's look at this text again. There's another one here. There's another hidden idol. And this is this hidden idol. It's not only just cultural, not just racial, it's religious. It's religious. See, the folks during this period, the Jewish people, these disciples specifically right now, they did not only like the Samaritans because of their race and that they were different, but they really believed that the Messiah was only to come back for them. They didn't believe that they would say he would save anybody else. He's for us. He's only for us. And then on that, uh, on that note, they thought that they were deemed holier than anybody else because they upheld the law a little bit more. See, they thought that these folks were half-breeds. They said, they're dogs. They don't deserve you, Jesus. They really don't want them to be saved. See, this idol of religion, it runs deep, deep within them, but it also runs deep within us too. See, this is a dangerous hidden idol because it doesn't matter how long you've been walking with Jesus. If you're a newborn again Christian or you've been walking for years and years and years, we're all going to struggle with this idol of religion. And the specific one I'm talking about is justifying your salvation based off of what you do for Jesus instead of what he has done for you. Instead of being saved by grace alone, through faith, nothing you've done. See, here's the point. These disciples, nor us, do we, do, we don't deserve anything from Jesus. We don't deserve anything good. We don't deserve salvation. We don't deserve anything. It's only by his grace. But because they think they've upheld the law like they should have or upheld this holy standard, they say, well, we're, we're worthy of it, right? Those, they're dogs. They don't deserve you, but we do. So instead of trusting God for salvation, they've trusted in their selves. They've trusted in this hidden religious idol. In other words, they've made their moral deeds or what they do more important than God himself. And see, this idea of morality in our culture has become much higher than God himself. If I could just do good enough, if I could just do more, if, if I do all of these things, I'm just a good person, right? That, that should warrant me a ticket into heaven. That should, that should make people actually respect me. I, I think I'm worthy of it. I love the way Tim Keller, pastor up in uh, New York, he says it this way. He says, the default mode of the human heart is to seek to control God 
and others through our moral performance. Because we have lived virtuous lives, we feel that God and the people we meet, they owe us respect and support. Though we may give lip service to Jesus, our example and inspiration, we are still looking to ourselves and our own, our own moral striving for salvation. Family, is that us? Is that us this morning? I mean, is your belief about God based off of what you can do for God or based off of what he's already done for you? And before you answer that question really quickly, it, really dive into it. You see, and I wish I had time to unpack this a little bit more. But see, I'm thankful that I have not been saved by my own works. See, I know my testimony. I know where I've actually come from, the streets of Gary, Indiana. I wasn't doing anything great in Gary, Indiana. I know what God has saved me from. And I'm thankful that it's been because of the grace of God and not based off of what I've done. Because if it was based off of what I've done, I would not be standing before you today. It's only because of the grace of God that I can stand up here and preach his word. And it's the same thing for all of us in here. If it had not been for the grace of God in our lives, his working on our behalf, nothing that we do, nothing that we can bring to the table, we would not be here. Y'all missed your amen. So family, the question, I know that's probably lingering in most people's minds right now. It's okay, I, I, Pastor, I have some of these hidden idols. What do I do? What do I do with these hidden idols? Where do I go from here? Here's the answer. The answer is simply acknowledge them. Acknowledge them. See, we have to be able to acknowledge the hidden idols in our lives. And when we do, here it is. It gives us freedom. It gives us freedom. See, this Samaritan woman here at this text from verses 7 through 26 she acknowledges the longstanding racial hate. She acknowledges the cultural hate between the Samaritans and the Jews. She says things like, you say worship over here, and we say worship over here. You asked me to give you a drink, and I'm a Samaritan. I shouldn't be able to give you a drink. And, and, and Jesus says, no, no, no. If you knew who I was, you would want a drink from me. And, and she said, well, look, well, look I, I, I acknowledge I've had five husbands. She starts talking about her own sin acknowledging it like willingly yeah, yeah that's true she willingly admits and acknowledges her mess and look what happens what happens Jesus saves her Whew. family what I'm trying to say is that when we acknowledge strongholds when we acknowledge these vices when we acknowledge these idols friends in our lives what happens is there there's freedom there's freedom because there's nothing now that's holding you back to receive what Jesus may have for you you're standing there saying, Jesus, this is me. I'm sinful. I, this is me, Jesus. I don't like that person. This is where I am. This is what I was raised with. Jesus, this is me. Make me the man or the woman that you want me to be. Jesus, this is all I have. See, it gives you freedom. Because it's not up to you anymore. It's up to him. But here, don't miss this. And I really want you to remember this. It's that God has to do the changing. God has to do, the, do the, unchanging, the changing because, look, here's what happened. When we start to acknowledge these things, when we start to see problems in our lives, it can become problematic. Why? Because think about it. I mean, if there's a problem in your life, what do you try to do? You try to fix it. You try to fix it, and here's the problem, is that when you start to realize these things in your life, they may be bigger than a habit. There may be something big and deep within your heart, an idol that's deep within your heart. And when it's deep within your heart and it's an idol, you start to worship it. You start to worship it. And when you worship something, you become a slave to it. It means it drives everything you're doing. So you can't just change it. You ha it has to be replaced. And the only way it can be replaced is by the one who, who deserves true worship, and that's Jesus himself. See, too many times we get into habits where we start trying to, oh, man, I've been dealing with this. I, I, I'm struggling with this. And we start trying to change things as if they're just habits. And what happens is we keep on slipping right back into the same thing over and over and over and over again. And the reason is it's probably not just a habit. It's probably something deeper that's actually driving it. It has to be replaced. Let me end and break it down a little bit more like this. 
my first car was a Pontiac, 91 Pontiac Grand Prix. I love that car. Yeah, I, I, it was nice. Dings, dents, and all. I had like a bowling ball sized dent in the side of the car, but I thought I was the man, y'all. I had 12 inch subwoofers in my trunk, TV on the headrest. It was, it was, it was my, my, my beauty. I love that car. And you're probably like, man, that thing is sound pretty bad. But see, somebody told me a long time ago, third class driving is better than first class walking any day. If you didn't get that, you get it on the way out. So I drove that car all over the place, and this car was pretty messed up, though. It had this huge oil leak in it. And if you were like me in high school, you didn't have that much money. So what I would do is, because I knew it had an oil leak, what I would do is every time I stopped to get some gas, maybe every two months or so, I'd buy me a couple quarts of oil. And I'd just pour some oil in that car making sure it had some oil. All the while, friends, as I'm pouring oil in the car, I'm not making the car any better. I'm making it worse. Because as the oil goes through the car, it's starting to drip out more and more, and it's, it's going through faster. And as the air is coming through the same way with all the moisture, it's making more and more rust, and the hole is getting bigger and bigger. See, if I really want to fix the car, I need to take it to the mechanic who can diagnose it, look under the hood, and he can say, man, there's the hole, there's the problem, let me fix it, I need to replace the, the oil pan gasket, let me fix it. You see, you may have just mixed, missed that, but see, some of us are just like me fixing my car. We start to see glimpses of problems in our lives. We start to see these things come up, and, and instead of taking them to Jesus, say, let me just put some oil on it. Oh, man, let, let me fix it this way. Let me do it this way. All the while, Jesus, the true mechanic, the, 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 the redeemer, is standing on the sideline saying, look, look, I see the hole. I see the problem. Stop trying to fix it. Just bring it to me. Let me replace it with me. Let me fix it. See, family, hidden idols, they can be tough. They can be tough because they're hidden. And because culture, it, it starts to drive things. It, it drives many of the things we do. I mean, the way we eat, who we eat with, what job we take, where we live, the people we hang out with, all of these sometimes get to be driven by the culture, by our, our race. But hear me, family. As we looked at this text, Jesus doesn't let any line of division, anything stop him from getting to this woman. Not her gender. He shouldn't have been talking to a woman in the middle of the day. Not her race. Not the culture. Not the religion. He doesn't let any of that stop him from talking to this woman. He crosses every line possible of division to talk to her. So if we learn anything about Jesus or from Jesus from this text is that culture should not drive the way we interact, the way we go about our lives. But instead, as Christians, as believers, we should be driving the culture. Big difference. But see, here's the point. We can't do that if we don't actually acknowledge these hidden idols first. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this time. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. God, we just ask that, as this is a tough word for anybody, the encouraging thing about it, God, is that just like you did with this Samaritan woman, you go out of your way to reach us too. And you still do it on a day-to-day -day basis, God. So I pray for Sacred City and myself that we would trust you with those tough cultural idols, with those tough hidden racial idols, with those tough religious idols in our lives. And we would give them to you, Jesus. And that you would take them and use us however you may to reach anybody, God, in this context or across the world, God. To your glory and your glory alone, Lord. We love you and we pray these things in the mighty name. And we said it together. Amen.